Thank you, everyone, and welcome to Global Home's final education event of the year. Um, so we're delighted to hear from tonight's range of speakers, including uh, Dr. Kate Charlesworth, Dr. Tom Rollies, and Professor Elizabeth Elliott, who will be exploring a range of diverse issues ranging from pediatric medicine, infectious diseases, and climate change impact on health. I'm Julie Fan, and I'm a first year student and um, Global Home Education Officer, and alongside Teresa Yu, we are chairing tonight's event. So, um, does everyone have the slide? I think it is, yeah, awesome. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, I'd like to invite Teresa Yu up to you. Um, invite Dr. Charles, I can see. <laughs> Um, so hi guys, I have the pleasure of introducing our very first speaker, Dr. Kate Charlesworth. So um, Dr. Kate Charlesworth is a public health registrar in Sydney. Um, in 2009 and 2010, she worked at the NHS Sustainable Development Unit to promote sustainability with public health registrars in the UK. And upon returning to Australia, she did a similar sort of thing. So she built on these projects um, and ran workshops on climate change, sustainability and health with Australian public health registrars. So without further ado, thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much, Teresa. So, as Teresa said, I'm a fast training public health medicine here in Sydney. I'm also about six months, six months into a PhD, looking at what a future sustainable health and social care system would look like. Um, this is certainly not where I imagined I would end up when I started out as an intern about ten years ago. Um, so, my story is that as a JMO, I was preparing to start physicians training. But I, at the same time, I was becoming increasingly frustrated, I guess, in the hospital system. Um, the, the cardiac patients were mostly overweight, the respiratory wards were smokers, the renal wards were diabetics. And so I got interested, I guess, in preventive care and sort of the, the big picture issues, things like obesity, policy, tobacco control, and so on. And so in uh, 2007, I took a year off, and I, just, well, I kept my hands in by going 50 shifts a week, which was pretty good money at, at that stage. Um, and I just as much as I had a full time job. But um, I did my Master's in Public Health here at this university. Um, and there was one uh, speaker called Professor Chani K. Hong. And he spoke about climate change um, and also sustainable and healthy cities. And I guess that was the point for me at which the penny just dropped. Um, not only was the science around climate change compelling, which I guess was something I'd been thinking anyway, but this concept of sustainability just made so much sense to me. Uh, on so many levels. It was sort of like, let's catch on. And so, uh, the following year, in 2009, I got a job in London as a research fellow, um, and started to look into this sustainability thing, and there was a lot more happening in the UK than there is here, and that, unfortunately, is still the case. Um, and the year after that, I landed my dream job. Um, and that was at something called the NHS, the National Health Service. Sustainable Development Unit. Now, this is a unit that had, had been set up the previous year, and it was a national unit within the NHS in England, and their task was to help the NHS become a leading, low-carbon, sustainable organisation. Now, this wasn't um, uh, an insignificant task. The NHS is the fourth largest organisation in the world, after um, the Indian Railways, the Chinese Army, and Walmart. So it was quite an ambitious undertaking. This unit has subsequently done some really innovative things and is, uh, has probably done more on this agenda than any other team in the world. So, today, um, I'm not going to talk about climate change. Um, there's a lot of information out there. I'm not a climate scientist, I'm a public health doctor. Um, but I will talk just briefly about climate change and health just to start to get, to get you to make that connection. Um, and then I'd like to talk about what, in my view, are the really interesting things. And that's, you know, what are the solutions and what, what's happening in this space? So briefly about the Sustainable Development Unit in the UK and what they've done, and then about future healthcare. So what is the future healthcare system going to look like? So, climate change and health. So when people ask, it's a question for you, when people ask what the health effects of climate change are, what do you think they say? Heat strike, yep. Oh. Come on, what else? Sorry, 
stuff. Yeah. So there's some top left. That's the food. The first one's food poisoning. Um, then cataracts, vector-borne disease, sunburns, skin cancer, floods, and heat waves. Those sorts of things. Okay. All of which are entirely true. Okay. But these aren't the big issues. These are the big issues. Um, that's um, drought, crop failure, economic collapse, mass migration, civil unrest, Easter Island. Does anyone know the story of Easter Island? Uh, yeah, in much of basically, yeah. Anyone care to elaborate? Um, I don't know much else apart from uh, some psychologists look at the statues as part of their isolation, their inability to spread or move from their current status, and that's why all the statues are keeping them prisoner. Yeah, exactly. So, for those who don't know, Easter Island is a really remote island, Polynesian island out in the middle of the Pacific, and a few hundred years ago when um, the European Explorers first discovered it, it was quite a sort of, a, sorry, the geographical um, record showed that it was once a heavily vegetated, densely wooded, thriving community of supporting thousands of people. By the time the European explorers arrived a few thousand years, a few hundred years ago, um, it was pretty desolate, only a few thousand people left. It was pretty much a desert. They chopped down all their trees, ruined their vegetation. And it's, it's held up as an example of isolated ecological collapse. Because, um, as one of your um, colleagues said, it was they were so isolated they couldn't go anywhere else. So it's just an example of ecological collapse. But you know, the thinking is that this is what's happening to Earth on a, on a larger scale. Um, so this is this is why climate change is important. This is why it's important for health and for life and society. Um, and if you think any of these things are an exaggeration, you need to start reading this space because there's pretty good evidence now for all these things. Um, and you know something on. This is sort of thing, seeing the military figures in the Pentagon in the UK, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really concerned about this and starting to act on these sorts of things. So this is why it's important. But I said I wasn't going to dwell on that, I'd rather talk about the more interesting things which are the, the solutions and the positive stuff. So this is the SDU, it was um, established in, eight, in 2008, so it's now in its seventh year. And it's a small unit based in Cambridge in the UK. Um, and the I guess of all night was first set up just purely within the NHS, so just within the healthcare system, but under the current Conservative government, its role has actually been expanded to include public health and social care. So it's got a much, much wider remit now. They're looking not only at carbon reduction, but also at sustainability. Um, and so the first thing, uh, first task they had was to reduce the carbon emissions of the NHS. Okay, big task. Um, and the first thing obviously they needed to show was to work out what those emissions were and where they were coming from. Need to starting point. So they measured the carbon footprint of the NHS, which is, to my knowledge, sort of the biggest scale of carbon footprint that's, that's been done in the world. And they've done it several times now. This is the latest data. This is based on 2012 data. So the total carbon footprint of the health and social care system in England is 32 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. Does anyone have any, sort of, any idea about how, what that is? It's a pretty abstract figure. That's more than the total emissions from a medium-sized country. Okay. So it's enormous. Um, and this was the breakdown. 13% on travel. So that's patients, staff, and visitor travel. That's the yellow. Um, part of the run through. 15% um, building energy use. So that's heating, cooling, lighting, of all healthcare sort of facilities. And then procurement was by far the biggest chunk, 72%. And what was the biggest chunk of the procurement? So the, the bar chart on the left shows you the breakdown of procurement time. So what's the, what's the biggest one? Pharmaceuticals. Yeah, pharmaceuticals. Is that what you guys would have guessed? Any questions as to why that's so high? Yeah, why is it so high? Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> that's um, so a lot of people are surprised about pharmaceuticals, but if you think about it, there is a lot of if you look at the sort of pharmaceutical supply chain, there's a lot that goes into research and development, and then manufacture, distribution, packaging, transport, wastage, you know, and then you look at how much we actually use. Um, and also the farmers, the chemical composition is obviously quite resource and carbon intensive as well. So that's why. But that, this was interesting. Nobody, had, nobody knew this before, that, that pharmaceuticals contribute so much to our carbon 
footprint. So obviously, this sort of information gives you some ideas about what we should be focus on, focusing on. So these you know, things that the bar chart on the left shows you the carbon hotspots they fall in there, um, looking at reducing. Um, and then medical instruments and equipment, which is always would have been my guess that was up there to move to point north. So this gave them some sort of idea as to where they were at. The next graph is about, over an hour talking through this, is about where they were going. Now we used to call this graph the ski slope graph. So on the x-axis down the bottom we've got the year, so from 1990 right up to 2050. Okay, so where obviously the year was about 2012, 2013. And then on the y-axis you've got the carbon emissions and the units are millions of tonnes of CO2 equivalent. So you can see that figure of 32 that I just gave you up there at the end of the dark blue line. So the dark blue line shows you the emissions to date. <clears throat> the light blue line is the forecast emissions up to 2025. And then the red and the orange lines are the targets. Now these targets are set in accordance with the Climate Change Act. Does anybody know what that is? So in the UK, they actually have legislation which mandates carbon reduction for the public sector. And that <coughs> act came in 2008, um, and that the, the figure that is the target is 80% 80, 80 reduction on 1990 levels by 2050. That's this job. So under that legislation, public sector bodies in the UK are required to meet those sort of carbon savings. Um, so you can see from the dark blue line that I've made some progress since 2008, certainly, thanks to you, and you know, for a number of reasons. But what does this, what does this, the red and orange lines, what does that tell you about the scale of the challenge required? <laughs> yes, it's pretty ambitious. This isn't going to be achieved by staff cycling to work and changing a few light bulbs. This is going to require transformation of the healthcare system. The world is going to have to be very different places so there's healthcare within it. So you start to sort of understand that this sort of radical transformational change is going to require people thinking outside the box. Not just doing what we're doing, tinkering around the edges and changing bits and pieces, but actually rethinking and redesigning the healthcare system. Okay. So this brings us quite nicely onto my PhD. So, I mean, this is sort of the environmental case, I guess you'd call it, but for a number of other reasons, health, social, if you look at our health and social care outcomes, if you look at the financial sustainability of the system, for all those reasons, there are a number of commentators now around the world calling for transformation of the health system. Okay, but this is, I guess, what I'm interested in, um, but from an environmental background. So, for my PhD, the two key questions for my PhD is what does the future sustainable health and social care system look like? And then secondly, how do we best transition towards that system? So that's what, I, that's what I'm doing at the moment. Um, and I'm only six months in, so if you, I don't know the answer yet, so I can tell you in a couple of years when I finish. But um, what I've been looking at so far, sort of the first piece of work that I've done um, was sort of based, essentially based on my literature review, and that was looking at what are the emerging trends in healthcare. So what are the things that are starting to happen now or, um, I mean, because it's slowly becoming established, that might be mainstream in the future. And I came up with six. Can you guess? Or oh, also called pockets of the future and the present. So things, pockets of things that are starting to happen now, I mean, 10 or 20 years might be quite mainstream. So I came up with six things. Any guesses? The clues, the picture of the clues. Two bits. That's like Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, sort of quantitative, it's called the quantitative self movement, if it is. But yeah, it's good. Anything else? The clothes are already becoming more frequent. Which they are too big. Yeah, they're big. Oh, like yeah. I didn't know that until six months. I didn't know what that was until six months ago. Um, it's the top left hand one, paperless healthcare. Yeah, it's sort of, RCT, information communication technology, yeah. So, yeah, that's a few things. Um, okay, so the first one which I don't have a picture was um, the paper I wrote was called First Do No Harm. So there are, it's becoming increasingly clear that there are significant risks, harms, and costs from overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Um, 
and so this raises a, a lot of commentators sort of predicting that in the future there'll be less, less medicine, less traditional medicine, um, but less tests, less treatment in that sense. The second one was um, ICT, information communication technology. Um, and the, I guess the predictions are that in the future most countries will have quite sophisticated um, electronic medical health records. Um, and if you think about it, once that data um, is digitised, standardised, um, and aggregated, we'll have a, a huge data, vast data resource called big data, which will enable, you know, which will, which will be amazing. Um, um, and then you look at things like telehealth as well. So the, the thinking is that in the future, telehealth is going to make much more uh, care to be delivered in the home or at least in the community. Um, and so we're likely to be, and there'll be much less, proportionally less hospital care. So the, some of the predictions are in the UK, they'll just have eight to 10 uh, sort of super, you know, quite specialised tertiary care centres, tertiary hospitals, and there'll be a lot more primary community care. Um, and then the existing hospitals, of course, will all be digitised much more efficiently run. Um, there's some charts, for instance, in Queensland at the moment, they're looking at um, AE admissions, because the traditional thinking is birth rate, ED admissions. Um, traditional thinking is that they don't know any what's coming through the door every day. But actually, if you look at if you look at the historical data, you can actually predict quite accurately what's going to come in on a particular day, particular season, you know, particular events coming on. So they're now using that to, to much better plan um, hospital services, staffing, all those sorts of things. Um, yes, yeah, so that's ICT. Um, the next one was it's called I call it patient empowerment, patient empowerment, and part of that was the quantified self movement. So again, the thinking is that in the future, patients will have much more involvement in their own care. Um, they'll need to be much better educated and informed about what their options are. Um, there'll be much more shared decision making, and in general, the, the patient and physician will play a much more equal role um, in their care. Um, and evidence suggests that if patients are responsible for making their own decisions, then they generally choose the best treatment. So there are obviously significant financial savings to be made as well. Um, and then as part of that, um, it's the quantified self movement. So I think this is saying this is just the, this is just the start. Um, in the future, there'll be all sorts of devices we'll be able to track almost everything you know about yourself. Um, and who knows what the sort of the outcomes of those things will be, whether it will be you know overall positive or negative, um, but certainly an interesting sort of phenomenon. Um, so the next one is about social social capital and resilience. So if you guys heard the story of um, Rosetto. US. So Rosetto is a, a small Italian American community in Pennsylvania, US. And in the 1950s, epidemiologists were amazed at the very low rates of myocardial infarctions that they had compared to neighboring towns. And this effect remained even after they adjusted for all known cardiovascular risk factors. So even after adjusting for weight, BMI, smoking status, all those things, they still had very low rates. They couldn't work it out. And then, um, uh, to revenge, I guess they figured out. Rosetto had, was a very tight knit community. Most of the people there had come from the same um, village in Italy, and they had really strong social bonds, lots of clubs, lots of great social networks, really diverse. Everybody looked out for each other, um, conspicuous wealth was derided, all those sorts of things. Um, and that was uh, now that, that's now that was the first known example of something which is now very well established, and that is that. Um, strong social networks and diverse social networks are independent risk factors for health outcomes. Um, and they're still trying to figure out exactly why, there'll be a number of reasons for that. But um, that's for that reason, there are a number of, sort of trials underway, particularly in Europe, um, looking at um, improving community, individual and community resilience of social networks. Um, community. So, Social networks, um, and then the last two were, oh, sorry, and there's an example that you can look at the neighborhood networks in the UK and this thing called multi generation partners in, in Germany. So they actually sort of essentially sort of trials that are underway, testing those things. Um, and the final two were um, aging integration and a good death. That's the last picture of the bottom right. Um, so, in terms of aging integration, it's no surprise that. Um, Keeping people healthy and socially active into 
um, their, their later years, um, reduces the need for formal care and reduces costs. So there's a, a strong focus on that. Um, and also integration, by integration I mean integration of health and social care. So in the UK now they're, they're doing this, um, the NHS has been integrated with social care um, and through the local governments they've established things called health and wellbeing laws and they're made up of healthy professionals as well as social care professionals and they make joint decisions about um, health and wellbeing of their community where they're jointly commissioning stuff. Um, there's pretty good evidence and as you become, as you start to work in hospitals, as Jane Rose will quite quickly become apparent to you as to why that's a good idea and why there's pretty good evidence to show that works. It's integration and lastly good death. Um, again there's pretty good evidence now to show that um, a lot of people in the last few years of their life you know, um, receive care that is inappropriate and or futile. And so the prediction is in the future there'll be a lot more focus on good communication, good planning um, and what they call compression of morbidity. So that is, uh, the ideal situation is that you live, live a long and healthy life and then you're unwell for a very short period of time and then you have a good death. Um, as opposed to the, the long period of morbidity which most people experience in life. So compression of morbidity and then a good death. And a good death obviously would include you know, understanding what the patient's wishes are, meeting those, really good communication, um, and things like advanced care planning, advanced care directing could be mainstream. <coughs> okay, so there's the sort of six emerging um, uh, trends that are far, who knows what will become sort of dominant in the future or what um, it will be if any. Um, but I guess together, collectively, they provide a bit of insight into um, what uh, a future system might look like. An interesting mix, I guess, of some sort of technological innovations that combine with a, a sort of return to traditional community social values. Okay. Any questions? So I was just going to, I guess the question is, once you sort of look at that, um, that sort of thing, and, and certainly for me in the last few weeks, is there, there are lots of uh, pockets of good practice going on all over the place, but is there actually an example of a healthcare system that is, that has got it right, that has undergone transformational change? And I think, this, this is very recent I've come across this, but I think there might be. Has anyone come across this before? South Central Foundation? I'll just, I'll just talk about South Central for a few minutes and then I'll finish up um, with questions because I want Tom speaking. So I'm going to come into Tom's time. But um, South Central Foundation is a healthcare organisation in Alaska, in the US. Um, and to cut a long story short, about 15 years ago, they had the opportunity for a number of reasons, um, which are quite complex, but the opportunity to completely rethink their healthcare system. Um, and they did, they redesigned it from scratch, from the ground up. And 10 or 15 years later, they had achieved quite extraordinary health outcomes. Um, you know, 50 and 60% reduction in emergency presentations, specialist referrals, primary care, um, and so on. Um, and Don Berwick, who is, was previously an advisor to the um, President Obama, and now, as I understand, it's a very senior role in the NHS in the UK. Um, he describes it as a leading example of healthcare research in the nation, maybe the world. Um, and uh, Oregon Health um, Organization and um, the Veterans Affairs in the UK, it's very in the US, and also parts of the NHS, particularly in Scotland, are now trying to adopt the same model. Um, and essentially, there are a lot of facets to it, but they have very, they, they spent the first six or 12 months just listening to what Alaska Native, mainly, mainly about Alaska Native people listening to what they wanted. They previously had very poor health outcomes, quite similar to um, indigenous health in this country. Um, listen to what they wanted and then redesign it. So they have very strong, exceptionally strong primary care. Doctors and nurses and health professionals don't work in traditional roles, they work in teams. So there's a physician or a, or a family doctor, a GP, who heads up the team. We have a, an RN um, who role, works in the triage role and then a couple of physician's assistants, which they have in the US administrative and then so that makes up a, sort of a team and they have a system called empanelment so every all the patients and the patients not called patients they're called customer owners so if you're interested in asking about that afterwards they are all assigned to a team they get to choose their team and they work very closely with our primary care team allied health staff including midwives and others are shared across a couple of teams so very strong primary care 
in which they know their patients really well. Um, patients get can have safe day access. They have very sophisticated um, monitoring uh, and evaluation and IT systems, um, and so they have the feedback um, is quite extraordinary that they can get feedback for safe days and feedback on their performance. The teams they're paid salaries, not paid fee for the physicians, not paid fee for service, they're paid by salary, but there are some incentives because there's some competition between the teams in terms of health outcomes. The health outcomes of um, everybody, of the customer owners, and South Central Foundation are amongst the highest in the US, which previously they were amongst the lowest. Um, but they've had very good sort of IT systems because they have obviously quite a rural and remote population as well. So there's lots of um, um, lots of factors to the system, but essentially they um, have done extraordinarily well and others are trying to copy them now. So it's um, a case of watch the space I guess. So if you want to do it, if you're interested at all, that's the one thing that I do have a look to South Central and what they've done there. It's quite um, an extraordinary story. Um, okay, so I'll finish on that. I'm happy to answer any questions and opinions. Um, can we as medical students what would you like to do? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, it, I mean, it depends what. I have, since I got back from the UK three years ago, I've done basic gynecology and basic stuff with college physicians, I ran those workshops. Um, it depends, I guess, what your, your, your experience or expertise is. There's not. I feel we've heard organisations like Doctors of the Environment Australia, I'm a member of DEA. Um, I mean, have a chat with me afterwards about what you know, you'd like to do. There's a, a small sustainability unit with New South Wales Health. There's, you know, as Jane Lowe, there's busy pieces going on, people trying to do things in their own hospitals and workplaces. Um, I'm doing a PhD. It, just, it depends, you know, I'm probably at the extreme of the spectrum or we can organise something in your workplace. So, yeah. Uh, is, there anybody, is there anyone else a member of the DEA, for example? Oh, oh man, you want to be like <laughs> Okay, well, you probably know more about DEA than me. So, there are avenues. There's not as much. I mean, to be honest, that Australia is a dark zone in space. We're way behind the UK and the US. Um, but we're, there's a group of us that are trying. Yeah, we can touch it. Yeah. So, in terms of the NHS, like, lack of community structure, is there any sort of. So, doing something like South Central? Yeah, well, it's basically got that really ambitious. Uh, how are they going to do that? Like, they're doing, but the answer is they're doing a whole bunch of things. They're focusing on things like pharmaceuticals, so obviously that's, they're doing a whole bunch of things. But the NHS is, it's, it's huge. And trying to, yeah. Um, they would like, I think they would like to do something like South Central, they'd like to just reinvent the whole system, but that would be difficult without really high level of support. Um, but they're, yeah, they're tr trying to, I guess, plant these little seeds within. Do you know how? Do you know how health care looks around in the, in the UK? It's every PT, primary care shop, and so on, and now that's changing with local government. So if each of those is individually, I guess my idea would be if you change, if you did in one region, like they're trying to do with the NHS in Scotland, they're trying to do something like South Central at the moment. So if you can prove that it works in one region, then you've got a good model, you've got good, you need good stats, you need, you need evidence good evidence base. Once you do that, then you could try and multiply in different regions. That's how I'd go about it. The STU is doing a number of different things, but they're not doing what South Central's done. I guess that's a short answer. Uh, and with the South Central, does that provide more doctors, or is it just more other people doing the same? <coughs> no, so what they, the structure of the team is that, the idea is that not everybody who comes in needs to see a doctor. A lot of the time, they need to see a like health professional or something they call behavioural health consultant, which is basically a health psychologist, or they need you know, to see a midwife or whatever else. So when somebody, a patient, customer owner, a patient calls up and says, I want to see somebody today, then the, the RN, the registered nurse who's usually an experienced nurse, they, they act as a bit of a tri triage. So they say, okay, what, what's the problem? What do you think you need to see? And they will designate who they see. So the idea is that everybody's working at the top of their skill base. So physicians see the, the complex stuff, they do the diagnostic stuff and so on, but they don't need to do regular prescriptions or give advice about you know, diabetes, lifestyle management or something like that. 
both these managed by other parts, other members of the team. So it's making it the most of everybody's skills is the idea. And in terms of your question on costing more, it's costing less. Very cost effective system. Because they have such strong primary care, they, they spend much less. I think something like a 50 or 60 percent reduction in emergency department presentations. That, if you look at what is expensive in healthcare, it's treasury hospitals. You have very significant, you have very strong primary care, they won't get sick in the first place. Not rocket science. Mm. But they've just, yeah, they've just done, you know, done that. It's sort of by book in a way. It's not about look, okay, what, what's the most effective way to do it? What do we want? Yeah. Is there anything similar to like, like, um, like Indigenous medical centers or something? Here, as far as I know, no. no. There was um, a public health physician in WA, Brett Hart, who was trying to do something similar. He's linked to the SCF. But it, I mean, I guess the question, I mean, I've literally come across that for the last few weeks. The question is, how could you do that? Yeah, I guess that's, that's the thing. You need, you need support, you need initial funding. They have, um, their situation is quite unique. So it's a question, how do you implement that sort of transitional change here without the, without the circumstances that they happen to have? Thank you, Dr. Charles, for well, that great time. <laughs> something in my throat. My apologies because I probably wasn't quite sure what you wanted to hear about in a very short time and then Julie told me that most people do come with slides so I thought I'd better throw some slides together to be authentic. So I thought I'd talk to you about some of the infectious diseases challenges that abound and then I'll concentrate on one aspect which is antibiotic resistance, okay? Um, so and the slides have been randomly put together in a short time this afternoon, and you could talk about infectious diseases for hours. So, the, as I said, there's just small items to bring in some points for discussion. I thought this was good because I re-remembered this. It's from Bleak House, but I don't know if it's that different 150 years on in many parts of the world where infectious diseases are causing problems, and you're all reading about the Ebola outbreak in Western Africa, which is just horrific, and you realize how a outbreak can decimate a community when there's insufficient infection control and insufficient medical support there. So that's the introduction. Now there's a link to the previous talk uh, in that one of the big problems for infectious diseases is going to be population growth and, uh, and climate change. And so just some statistics, but um, by population of slum, do slum dwellers in, in the world probably increases by about 25 million people every year. And that causes massive political and economic problems. It affects housing and sanitation. And as you can imagine, a lot of infectious diseases suffer because of insufficient sanitation. And that's how um, vectors and uh, microorganisms and also antibiotic resistance spreads. And of course, if it re leads then to poor education, then that breeds further economic and political problems, which then in itself leads to problems in infectious diseases. So if you look at um, just the question of climate change or changing world environment, this is just a list of things that are probably going to be affected by vector uh, change and zoonotic changes in the coming years. So you can think of other viruses like dengue and chikungunya and yellow fever, a lot of which have increased. Dengue virus have spread uh, around the world, different stereotypes moving around the world. You might be aware that certain forms of viral encephalitis like West Nile fever has emerged in one part of the world and spread across the Atlantic to the United States and now it's spread across the US. So you can see real emergence of um, specific diseases we have rickettsial diseases that are often isolated. 
that can, that can spread according to uh, changes in the, in the environment and malaria, leishmaniasis. And at the bottom, in the last two points, are the new emerging viruses that we often get surprises around about. So you might have heard about Middle Eastern respiratory viral syndrome, and which now is spread from the Middle East. Well, it's very much contained in the Middle East, but the vector is probably the bats spreading the virus into camels and then onto humans. And there have been about a 40% mortality in those people who've got uh, infections. You know about the SARS outbreak previously and then the current problems with Ebola and its potential spread. And you, you can see, if you look at vector-borne disease mortality distribution, you can see where the primary problem around the world is. And it, again, it's in the tropics and it's uh, in the underprivileged part of the world. I thought I'd put this in here because it just happens to be a patient that we saw last month. And this guy had traveled to Bolivia and went for a walked through the rainforest, and then a month or so later developed an ulcer, and it broke down, and it took a few months for the diagnosis to come along. And it reminded me um, to put this in, because last week there was a nice little article in JAMA where a similar patient went from South America back to the US and took a few months and had massive amounts of useless antibiotics for a disease which should be self-evident, this is leishmaniasis, it's spread by a vector, and again, good medical education could fix it, but it's surprising how little people think of the things that may be common from uh, diseases related to exposures that you should predict. But also what the article in JAMA showed me is that how we reliant on, in a very busy healthcare system, when you see a patient with something that looks like an infection, you give them antibiotics, and if they fail, you give them another antibiotic, and so it goes and on and on, and very little reflection on what the problem may be. I should, should put it into a um, form like this so I can move on. Okay, so what are the trends? In the, there have been 30 new diseases that have emerged since 1976, according to WHO. The mortality from infectious diseases has increased, so we always, there was a, a famous quote from um, the US Surgeon General in the early 80s that said that we've conquered infectious diseases, but in fact we haven't, in fact the mortality from infectious diseases has continued, and a certain subset of this was HIV AIDS, and we're seeing lots of reappearing diseases, such as TB, especially multi-drug resistant TB in some parts of the world, have come onto it, malaria, which is re-emerging, resistant forms of typhoid, etc. So if I think of it in a simplistic sort of manner, um, and I'm sure this is not quite true, but it suited my purpose today, is in the good old days, you had a transmissible agent and you had a susceptible population, and maybe you had a vector that might move around a bit, but often acquisition of immunity leads to epidemic control, and you can control that outbreak. What's happened more recently in the world we live in, and even more in the future, I imagine, is that you may have a transmissible agent and you may have a susceptible population. But these agents come under genomic pressure through a number of different uh, circumstances, but one of which is antibiotic pressures. You have random mutations as well, and you have all other manner of changes that now we can document very well with molecular methods. But in terms of the susceptible populations, We've changed the world incredibly. So we have people with immunosuppression, such as retroviruses. We travel more, there's migration. As I've already pointed out, urbanization, which has its own effects. We do a lot of change to agriculture um, and to forests. Our lifestyles change. We food process in amazing ways. In the old days, if you got an episode of gastroenteritis, you assumed it was just one cow and your meat came from one cow. If you get minced meat now, you, you assume that you've probably got 100 cows in there. It doesn't take one, sorry, I'm just being humorous here. Um, you, you don't, our capacity to transfer uh, microorganisms is that much more intensified by the ability to move our um, food around so, so quickly. And of course, human behavior. And technology for its better and for its worse things. So that's one part of the talk. I just put that in because I was looking for humor. But um, this is 
the majority of Americans aren't prepared for the apocalypse. And um, I was fascinated by all the re um, responses on social media about Ebola in the United States and the fear and paranoia that that has engendered. And it's fascinating how it leads often to racism and to paranoia between the, in populations. But that's a digression. So what do they say here? Our survey of households in seven US regions demonstrated that few citizens have bothered to equip themselves with things to deal with volcanic upheaval, solar flares, and the Lord's purifying flame. Um, I thought it was funny. Anyway. <laughs> OK. I'm going to talk about antimicrobial resistance. Um, antibiotic resistance is something that does affect us, because a lot of the things I've just talked about, Australia is a far-flung island removed from we see incidental problems we're not as much involved with. But antibiotic resistance is affecting us, and antibiotic resistance is a worldwide problem that requires an uh, international solution. The background is we've got a withering antibiotic pipeline. Um, there's been a lack of investment into new antimicrobials, partly because pharmaceutical companies saw profit margins in non-infective agents that you take for months or years rather than antibiotics that you just take for a few days, and often people tell you to stop but partly because the rewards for the pharmaceutical industry are not there. So by the time they bring a drug to market, they're not going to recoup the investments for a drug that's only used for a short period of time. So you could be critical of them, and you could also be critical of a system that doesn't reward uh, innovation. We've had poor global management of antibiotics, and partly because we use so many antibiotics in agriculture and the animal um, world, often for growth enhancement, and but partly also because we've got a schizoid approach by physicians, because we often look at things and we say, well, it's okay if I prescribe poorly because one little bit of poor prescribing is not going to change the world, but it all adds up, and, and it's a volume of antibiotic use that drives resistance, and this ensures that the problem's with us. This is just a graph of uh, antibiotic development, and you can see how many antibacterials have been approved in the US, in the FDA, uh, over that sort of 20 year period. So, limited numbers of new antibiotics. I'm just going to talk about a few antibiotic resistant organisms. Community MRSA, which is a, um, a strain of Staph aureus that has acquired a gene for resistance, and it's, uh, and it's got acquired a toxin gene which drives virulence, which allows for um, soft tissue infections and sometimes necrotizing pneumonia. And part of in the main, driven by antibiotic use in the community. And we've seen an increase of community MRSA, particularly in indigenous regions and also um, rural regions of Australia, but often in children in urban communities as well. So that's been rising, and you can just see an example of a boil or a patient with uh, a large lipid collection of, of pus. And so community MRSA does that, and you can just see Australian figures for MRSA going up and up, and this is just up to 2008. So that's increasing in Australia. MRSA, in a way, is controllable because the one big effect on MRSA, which is very much an organism that's carried on our hands, is that we've introduced hand hygiene. So you can see all these uh, bottles of hand hygiene have magically appeared on our wards, but we're still not very good about infection control. We still use our mobile phones, and we don't do anything about it, or I'm sure we do this as well. So certainly the introduction of hand hygiene has controlled the spread of MRSA, hospital type MRSA. But at the same time, you can see the rise of gram-negative resistance. So E. coli is a typical gut organism, and the ESBL positive strains are codes for very resistant to E. coli. And this is in Europe, the, the rise of these very resistant organisms that probably, if you've got one of these E. coli, and you're hospitalized and you're sick, your mortality is about three times higher. Um, and you can see that this is just a tenfold change in Europe for these ESBL type organisms. So these are E. coli resistant to cephalosporins. And all the green countries here had less than 5% resistant in bloodstream infections in 2002. And you can see that 10 years later, a lot of these countries have now 10 to 25% resistance and some of them have greater than 50% resistance. That's in an incredibly short period of time, and that drives mortality, and it drives further use of antibiotics. Uh, this is just 
um, use of carbapenems, which are our sort of broader spectrum antibiotics. And you can see what's happening in Netherlands, US. But the problem isn't just in the Western world. It's really happening in, in India and in Pakistan and China. And you can see this massive use of antimicrobials, which is driving resistance. And I'll probably skip that. Australia is at the lower end. But when you're on an exponential curve, you often don't realize how big your problem is. And certainly, our rates of resistance are just gradually going up. And again, as I said, you're, when, when you're on an exponential curve, you don't quite see the problem. But I think the future is that we're going to see much more resistance and limited choices of antibiotics. So when you go to parts like um, when you go traveling, this is a nice little study that was done in uh, Canberra, where they took people before travel, and they did a rectal swab. And most people who volunteer themselves were nursing staff. And they had about 3 to 7% resistance to organisms. And when they came back from travel, about 40% of them had resistant organisms in their gut on rectal swabs. So it just gives you an idea about the transmission and the prevalence of resistance around different parts of the world. And again, driven by antibiotic use and poor agricultural practices and so on. So what can we do? Well, we've got the Hippocratic Oath, and we say life is short. and Art is long, the, the occasion fleeting, and experience is fallacious, and judgment difficult. So you may as well use broad spectrum antibiotics. And when you're on the wards, you'll see this happening all the time. And and I think it's uh, it's a very common problem that I see that we, our practices in antibiotics are very much driven by the immediate need and the perception of failure. So if you see a patient, the first thing you do is reach out for something that might give you a perception of uh, um, success or that you don't fail for that individual patient. But we don't often look beyond that to the problems that might arise from that down the line. So it's often a, a battle between individual success and societal needs. So I'll skip that, I think. And um, this is yes. So luckily, you can still get antibiotics um, from McDonald's. But it's not quite true. This is from the onion. <laughs> What are the other issues in infectious diseases? I'll go through very quickly. C Clostridium difficile has been an interesting example of some of the problems we see. And it's an organism that causes gastroenteritis, but it very much causes disease in people who have been antibiotic exposed. But what, it's always surprising how new things come out of left field. And one of the problems with C difficile is that it's an organism we've known around about for the last 20 years, but in the last five or 10 years, this organism has acquired extra toxicity uh, in the sense that it's acquired a virulence gene. And because it occurs in people who've been given antibiotics and in hospitals, and it's an infection control problem, it's propagated by poor uh, systems in hospitals. And in the NHS in the UK, they recognized that C. difficile swept through the hospitals until it became an issue that each hospital had to address from administration top down. And the administrators became responsible for infection control and therefore improving infection control practices, starting with hand hygiene. And that's made a big uh, impression and it's controlled some of the outbreaks. Interestingly, you always get benefits from certain diseases. And one of the things that, one of the ways you control Clostridium difficile is people are recognizing by uh, methods like fecal transplantation, and people are now realizing that um, gut microbiota and gut organisms are very important, and we probably have underestimated how they inform our own risk for health by the gut organisms that we carry with us, and how when we disturb them, for example, with antibiotics, affects how we travel um, as individuals. Big problem around the world, less so in Australia, is tuberculosis. This patient was an Australian-born submariner, and he, um, he developed a cough and had it for about three months. And this is his heart, and it's right up in the neck. And basically, he's dissolved his upper lobes, and this is all tuberculosis. This is a patient with uh, TB lymph nodes. But extra drug-resistant TB sweeping the world, and it's going to become an increasing problem in, again, marginalized part of the world. So 2006, 17 countries worldwide reported cases of extremely drug-resistant TB, which is virtually untreatable and has a mortality of anywhere between 20 to 50%. Whereas when I see a patient with TB that's fully susceptible, 
you know you can reassure the patient that you can cure them in six months. So these cases are truly worrying, and the spread of this, which often occurs in, in prisons and difficult circumstances, again, is worrying in the way it will spread around the world. And these are the countries that have reported XDR-TB in the hashed um, lines here, but you can see different ranges of multidrug resistant TB in different parts of the world, particularly in the old Russian republics, but also in parts of Africa and South America. Well, I'll come to an end very quickly. We're seeing increasing rates of uh, drug resistant typhoid. Um, we're seeing drug resistance in Neisseria gonorrhea, so STDs, where we have gonorrhea, which we always used to think of something you could treat with a single dose of antibiotic, but that's no longer the case. And there are strains that truly look like they may be untreatable emerging around the world. And this is just to alert me to remind you about the good and bad about HIV. This is a patient with syphilis, and syphilis is uh, becoming more common in Australia again. And again, people, people who lived through the HIV um, AIDS era, um, there was a lot of control that occurred, but now with antiretrovirals, that control of sexual practices is slipping again, and we're seeing a lot more transmission of STDs. But HIV brings together a couple of issues about infectious diseases, how certain uh, viruses and diseases can spread very rapidly, although if you look at the timeline, probably it first emerged in parts of Africa in the 1920s and 30s and took a long time before it spread. But it tells you something about globalization. But it also tells you how we have great potential to develop new methodologies and new drugs. And at the end of the day, despite the, the massive uh, amount of HIV patients who are infected around the world, there's also an optimism in the sense that we can counter it and develop drugs that, that can control the disease. What we can do with antibiotics is a different problem, and it worries me because I think it requires a lot of um, interaction around the world with, between governments and professional societies, and also requires more than just human medicine, but requires governments to control antibiotic use in agriculture, and whether they're willing to do that, I think that's a difficult thing. So look, this is just a cook's tour through things in infectious diseases. I guess if I'm gonna talk about what you can do, I, it's difficult for me to answer because I guess I work in a hospital system and I see people coming through the training system, but, but certainly, I would probably think on, on the one thing in Australia that we can do something about, and that's how we think about antibiotics, making sure a good approach to, a measured approach to antibiotics, because we want to preserve them, we still want to use them, needs to get into our curricula and how we think about it and how we influence prescribing in hospitals. Um, there's an etiquette of prescribing. We never challenge our seniors into what they do because we all feel that they're senior, we're junior, and we should never rock the boat. But I think we should be challenging things both on infection control, hand hygiene, but also how we use antibiotics into the future because I think we really do need to preserve them until the time that new developments and new innovation comes around and helps us along the way. Okay, well that's my bit, and, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, given the, the, the antibiotic prescribing practices um, background that you showed in India and Pakistan, where there are vastly increasing the prescription for cause effect antibiotics and the, uh, the, so the antibiotic resistant strains apparently come from India and Pakistan to Australia uh, as the nurse has been shown. Um, do you think that anything we do in Australia is actually going to make a difference when compared with the, the size of the problem over there? Yeah, it's a good question. We've all grappled with this. Um, it's a mosaic, you know, and um, you, you, can't, you can't close your eyes to it and say, well, it's a problem over there, that, that, therefore I will do nothing here, because most of our antibiotic resistance is, in fact, driven by our use. So, first of all, you've got to get your house in order. Then the other thing is that our government, it, we, so we've got to do it at our level. We've got to preach, sorry, we've got to do what we along as with what we preach, but we also need to influence our government and our policies, both for what we do locally, but also to influence uh, measures overseas. Now, how can you do that? It's difficult. You can do it through trade, because you may put a, 
um, test on what kind of things you import and put pressure on the kind of foods that are accepted. If they've got antibiotic residues, maybe we won't accept that, and that goes back to the um, originating countries. But we could also put pressure through NGOs like WHO and getting um, WHO is putting together a global action plan on antibiotic resistance, and Australia is a key member state. So you can do it through that way, it's where you put pressures on individual states to have certain things in place in their setting, such as you know, antibiotic stewardship in hospitals or uh, um, limitations on growth promotion antibiotics and so on. So we can influence that by having our measures adopted or putting pressures that way. But I take your point that this is a truly international problem and I think that the politicians have grappled with that. They, they're very happy to look at, say, obesity in Australia or depression in Australia because it's identifiable. You can see a person with it and you can try to deal with it. And you know it's an Australian problem. It's very hard for them to say, look, um, antibiotic resistance will, will save ourselves by implementing measures here because it, you know, antibiotic resistance has no boundaries. I, I think it's a difficult one. Yeah, I think you're you're right. I think we all see a proportion of the things um, that happen. Actually, the best example I think is um, bacteremia from cannula infections. I know it's a different issue, but when you're working in infectious diseases and you see everyone who's getting those bacteremias, you see wow, there's a lot happening here, we need to do something about it. But when you're in one unit, you see one a year, you think, well, it's not such a problem, really. So sometimes you're blindsided by things you see little of. And I, I agree with you, most general practitioners don't see the resistance, but they have a lot of pressure from patients um, to prescribe. So if you're going to do something about antibiotic resistance, you know, it's an educational issue, and it's an educational issue for prescribers, and it's an edu educational issue for the consumers, you've got to marry both. You've got to be careful. Yeah, well, I think you've got to have limits. Actually, the best success story for Australia, which tells you what works. We've tried education for a long period of time and we fail, and I can see it in the wards. We're putting all these antibiotic stewardship things around, but they hardly work at all, and I think we only touch the margins. The one thing that's worked in Australia is when you have regulation. The authority system actually works. Um, and one example is the one drug that we've regulated in Australia are the quinoline antibiotics, uh, which have never been approved for veterinary reuse, and they've never been approved in the community except by authority. And Australia, for the fact that it's a high volume antibiotic use country, has got the lowest rates of quinolone resistance around the world, both in, in veterinary drugs, or zoonotic drugs, uh, organisms like Campylobacter, but also in um, quinolone resistance in E. coli, for example. And it's all due to the fact that we've regulated those antibiotics. That's the one thing that works. On the other hand, you've just got to be careful, because the reason you're trying to preserve antibiotics is because they save lives when you use them properly. And you've got to be careful about regulating to that extreme where you're going to stop people getting um, ready treatment when they need it because those anecdotes are then going to drive um, uh, reaction and people will say, well, I didn't get the right antibiotic and somebody died and you get the counter effect. So you've got to do it in a careful way. But I think at the end of the day, yes, regulation does matter. Thank you very much, Dr. Gottlieb. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our final speaker for this evening, uh, Professor Elizabeth Elliott, who is a Professor of Paediatrics and Child Health at the University of Sydney. Um, since 2005, she's been running education workshops for clinicians in Dien Bien Province in Vietnam, I believe, yep. um, where she's been addressing high maternal and child mortality. In 2008, she went to the Prime Minister's 2020 Summit and was also made a member of the Order of Australia for her work in paediatrics and child health. And most recently, and most relevant for tonight, I suppose, she's um, accompanied the team from the Australian Human Rights Commission, headed by Professor Julian Triggs. 
and she's visited the Immigration Detention Centre on Christmas Island, and she's you know, been part of the team to write the report on the National Inquiry into Children in Immigration Detention, which I believe is due to come out quite soon, hopefully. Yep. So without further ado. interesting. Yeah. Great, well thank you very much for that introduction and um, uh, I was asked to talk about a variety of the sort of work that I do and I think it's just an illustration of what medicine can offer a great range of uh, a great variety in our career which I'm sure uh, the other speakers will agree. Um, now I, we were, I think the topic for tonight is um, looking what we can do globally, what is done globally and how that applies locally and vice versa. And so I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of the sort of work I do and how that may, may relate to the topic. I think importantly, uh, we need to remember that as clinicians we can be advocates and I think that's what my work in the last couple of years has indicated to me, that we really do have a voice and that's a voice that is heard and we must advocate for our, our, um, our patients. So I'm going to talk a little bit about disadvantage in child health, a bit about alcohol in pregnancy, and a bit about children in refugees. Um, so as I've said, we do need to advocate for children. The UN Convention for the Rights of the Child says every child has the right to life and survival, and the health care that's required to achieve that. And we all deal with disadvantage, but we live in the region of the, the Asia Pacific in which there are many millions of children, uh, I think are half the world's children, and many of them are living in disadvantage. And as Teresa mentioned, um, I've been working in the far northwest of Vietnam uh, in, for about 10 years. And I first met this little girl, who's from the Hmong uh, ethnic group, at this hospital in Dien Bien Phu. Uh, this hospital was just built, it looks great, it was brand new, but unfortunately there was no equipment, there were no drugs and very few of the health professionals were trained, uh, none of them in paediatrics. So we're looking at Nguyen Dien Bien Phu, way up in the far northwest of Vietnam, about uh, 500 kilometres from Hanoi, in a very mountainous region, which is very poor. There are very low literacy rates, and there's been systematic neglect uh, by the government. And importantly, there are 21 ethnic minority groups who really haven't featured in the government's um, uh, plans so far. So this little girl had come from even for the, about 180 kilometres out of Dien Bien Phu. So you go up through the rice paddies and into the mountains and eventually get up through on very rough roads. It took us about 12 hours to do 180 kilometres in this uh, old ambulance where you find that people are living in extremely remote areas. And I noticed one of your slides, the denuded um, pop, uh, vegetation. These people are subsistence farmers. They've denuded the landscape really as firewood. And this woman lived 70 kilometres by, from this road by a dirt track. Um, so really poor access to health care. Uh, the local health workers are male and of course the women don't speak to, don't like speaking to men. And vaccination, Tom, uh, they said there was vaccination but we saw a major outbreak of measles. And of course, there's no refrigeration, so it's very difficult to maintain the cold chain. These are the sort of hospitals that these people are treated in, um, very poor equipment. And as I mentioned, this was one of the, the children um, who fortunately survived the measles outbreak. So there are lots of barriers to health care, poor access to services because of the geography, women unwilling to consult men, lack of transport, and importantly, the lack of female education. So most of these girls finish school by uh, year six, age 12. And there's a very, very strong correlation between maternal education and, and child health outcomes. Of course, there is limited training opportunities. That's why they love us going up there to offer any 
uh, educational opportunities, uh, poor resources and equipment. And we tend to take simple equipment, not complex equipment, but simple equipment that is not costly and that we can show them how to use and, and maintain. There are, of course, language and cultural barriers and uh, poverty and lack of education I've mentioned. And when we go up there, we take all of our equipment with us and uh, we work in, in often very remote towns, uh, providing very hands-on interactive education in maternal and child health to not only doctors, but nurses and other health professionals. And this really broke down a lot of barriers in Vietnam where they're used to very didactic teaching, no interaction, no discussion with the tutor, and certainly not doctors and nurses uh, learning in the same environment. So when I tell you about that story, um, I really want you to realise that actually we are dealing with, in Australia, um, many developing communities within Australia itself, and this particularly applies to Aboriginal communities in, in remote Australia, which face the same challenges in health and education as many of our uh, neighbours in developing what we refer to as developing countries. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. Uh, the second issue I'm going to talk about is rare diseases. So for about 21 years I've run a rare disease surveillance system in Australia whereby every paediatrician in the country gets a little report card every month and they have to say whether or not they've seen one of these rare diseases listed. So we're able to get a snapshot of what's going on in Australia. So there are thousands of rare diseases and of course individually they're extremely rare but if you put them all together they're collectively quite common. So um, about 400,000 children under the age of 15 have one of the known rare diseases, and this will increase as the Genome Project increases. But these diseases have been neglected, orphaned, forgotten. There's lack of national data, lack of training in how to deal with these conditions, lack of specialised services, tests and treatment, lack of research funding, lack of drugs, um, Tom mentioned the pharmaceutical companies, certainly they don't want to develop drugs that are going to be used only in a very small number of people. Um, and there's been lack of support for patients. So um, we have been advocating to, to try and get the sort of whole issue of rare diseases in children on the map. This just shows you how the, the system works. That's the yellow report card that we started with, and of course now most of those cards go by email every month. So clinicians see a child, report it to us, if they say yes, they've seen a child, then they are asked to provide de-identified data by a, a questionnaire which is downloaded into our database. So APSU promotes research collaboration. In 20 years, we've uh, coordinated about 53 studies. Uh, over 300 individuals have used the scheme to conduct research, over 200 organisations, and we've had over 90% response rate to over 300,000 cards sent at the 20-year mark which really shows the um, importance of trying to involve practicing clinicians in research and their willingness to provide information that, uh, that we request. And now what we're doing is advocating to the government for a national plan. And you can see that um, back in 2010, I think we, uh, 2009, we published saying that Australia needs a national plan. We still don't have one. And this was picked up recently by The Lancet uh, in 2012, saying that without a well-considered plan, people will continue to receive suboptimal care and support. And rare diseases has really begun to emerge globally as, as an issue of concern. I'm now going to switch tack and talk a little bit about alcohol in pregnancy and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, which I've spent about the last 12 years working on. And of course, globally, we have a major problem with alcohol, and this also applies to Australia, where our population drinks amongst the highest amount of alcohol in the world, 10 litres of pure alcohol per person per year, and that's um, people over the age of 15. And of course, many people don't drink, and many people between 15 and 18 don't drink either. So what about alcohol in pregnancy? Well, we know it's very common. Non-Indigenous women, 80% of them, up to 80% of them, tell us that they drink during pregnancy. And although it's often perceived that Indigenous women drink more, they don't drink more often, but they often drink in a different pattern, a binge drinking pattern. So it's important, again, the advocacy, to remember that everyone gets a say in the alcohol debate, except the fetus, and we do need to advocate for them. You will well be aware that whatever you drink, 
you get a blood alcohol level, that can be transmitted uh, almost instantaneously across the placenta. And that alcohol is a teratogen. Teratogen. That is, it disrupts the normal development of the embryo and fetus and can result in a wide range of defects. This relates not only to the dose of, of the amount of alcohol you drink, but the frequency and, and the timing in pregnancy. And it's very difficult to predict the risk in an individual. So people say to me, how, mu how much can I drink? What's a safe amount? And the answer is, we don't know. We'll never know. We're not going to do randomised trials in pregnant women. Um, and my alcohol level will be very different from yours because of my age, my pre-existing disease, my genetics, uh, the way I metabolise alcohol, uh, my body composition, a whole range of, of features. And we know that also the fetal genotype uh, determines uh, their risk for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So we do need to know what alcohol can cause because we have a drinking culture. Binge drinking is common in teens. Unplanned pregnancies run at about 49% in Australia, and we know that there's alcohol use in pregnancy, as I've just told you. We also know now that alcohol can cause a whole range of disorders, not just fetal alcohol syndrome, which is what we learned about um, in our medical school. It was only described in the literature in 1973. Tom and I graduated in 1980, and I don't think it even came into our curriculum. Um, but we do know now that there's a whole spectrum of disorders which include children with the physical features of fetal alcohol syndrome and partial fetal alcohol syndrome, but also children with neurodevelopmental disorders associated with alcohol who don't have those physical features. And that's because the brain continues to rapidly develop through the second and third trimesters after the facial features and the other organs have already formed. So that's really something that's uh, only been a realisation in recent years. So you don't need to be um, a brain surgeon to appreciate that the brain on the right in the child who died of fetal alcohol syndrome is different from the one on the left. It doesn't work. The neuronal pathways have been disrupted. Uh, it's a small head. Um, the neurotransmitters would have been abnormal, and it's really structurally very abnormal. Um, but you don't have to have that sort of brain to have dysfunction. Speech and language problems, developmental problems, problems with growth, problems with memory, executive function, IQ, etc., which is what we commonly see in these children with this uh, spectrum of disorders. And you'll be familiar with the facial features uh, of fetal alcohol syndrome. If you look at those top two bars, the very thin upper lip, the lack of definition in that philtrum uh, in those two pictures, the uh, small palpable fissure, the brain, the uh, alcohol affects the development of the brain, the development of the optic nerve, the size of the eye, and hence those palpable fissures are small compared to uh, population norms. And you can see that these features apply whether you're looking at a Hispanic, Caucasian, or Afro-Caribbean child, and indeed they apply in the indigenous population. And we know that these problems are problems throughout Australia in non-indigenous and indigenous children. But the indigenous women um, in the communities that I've been working in Fitzroy, around Fitzroy Crossing, were very concerned that if you've got a child who has a poor memory, who can't learn, who can't retain information, that's going to disrupt the transmission of the oral culture the stories, the dances, the songs, uh, the language that is so important for maintaining Indigenous culture. And June Oscar, who you may have heard um, speak, uh, said that fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are a tragedy that somehow transcend other aspects of grief and trauma. Here is innocent young life, the future of our people, our culture, our language, knowledge about the magic creation and laws of our land, being born into this world with brains and nervous systems that are so impaired that life for that person from birth to death is cruelly diminished. And having made this statement, in fact, in, in the parliament in 2008, we were invited up into the communities to help them progress a strategy to diagnose and prevent fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and to support the parents of children living with these disorders in these communities. And in these remote communities in Australia, alcohol is decimating the, the lifestyle. Um, alcohol has been used for about four decades, uh, highly prevalent. And we know that in this group um, that we examined, it, it was uh, regularly used in pregnancy. 
so we took on this study. Fitzroy Crossing is about there. It's about um, 400 kilometres inland from Broome. Uh, and once you get to Fitzroy Crossing, the 45 communities in the Fitzroy Valley are up to 200 kilometres on very rough dirt roads. So what did we do? We uh, identified two age cohorts of children and we spent a year going out to these communities and interviewing them, particularly interested in our uh, antenatal exposures, including alcohol. And what did we find? We found that 55% of these women drank in pregnancy, mostly beer, full strength beer from cans. But the women who did drank, drink, drank at very risky levels. And what that means is 10 to 15 drinks in a, a usual sitting in a day. In the second year of the study, we went and, and did a full multidisciplinary assessment in these children. So OT, physio, speech therapy, psychology, and pediatrics, eye and ear, and then applied international criteria, uh, diagnostic criteria for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And not surprisingly, these are very high rates and they're amongst the highest in the world. Um, and those data are about to be published, both the alcohol data and the fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorders data. And these children had many behavioural problems, physical problems, mental health problems, problems with their motor function, and a lot of psychological problems, memory, academic uh, performance, etc. We were fortunate that this was a topic of interest. Um, uh, it's just become of interest to governments because it's just come onto their radar and that people like Quentin Bryce visited us during our study. The community has been praised for raising this issue. It's been non-PC for so long that they haven't been able to talk about alcohol, let alone alcohol in pregnancy. Um, and we've been able to support the communities in their move for no grog. So there's been alcohol restrictions introduced throughout the, the valley. You can now know, you can now only buy low strength beer to take away, no full strength beer or wine or spirits, which has had a dramatic reduction, like the figures you mentioned, 60% reduction in alcohol-related violence and hospital admissions, etc., from that one initiative. Um, and some of the communities have elected now to become totally alcohol free. We have made four films in association with this project, including this one about a little boy, Tristan, who lives uh, in the community. And we were fortunate to be able to take that to the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, where of course we realised that this was a global issue, that all of these Indigenous communities, and I suspect the ones you mentioned in Alaska are part of this, certainly in America, throughout Canada, um, uh, where populations have been dispossessed of their land, um, subject to colonisation, um, and disempowered, deprived of access to education and healthcare quite often, and alcohol has become the substitute for stress. And so that we see this problem throughout um, these many communities. Um, and, and this was Mick Gooda, who was the uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Human Rights Commissioner, was with us on that visit and uh, recognised that this research with these people um, is very important and really the only way to do research with Indigenous people is to do this as a true partnership. So the community prioritises the problem, they invited us in and we assist them in, in uh, achieving their goals. And of course we've now been able to use this information to inform Aboriginal alcohol and drug workers and to contribute to the literature. There's been quite a lot of publicity on this issue recently, including a program on Insight, where they de-emphasise this as an Indigenous problem. Certainly there are high rates in localised remote communities, but this is a problem spread throughout our white communities. And our group has also been involved in uh, campaigns to try and prevent fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, including this one, to, to suggest that men, that perhaps they might pause in their alcohol consumption for the nine months of the pregnancy. Someone's nodding there, that's good. Um, we've also been able to be involved through a, a government tender in developing a screening and diagnostic tool for doctors, because this is a problem that's been poorly recognised by health professionals. And in fact, the Department of Health has uh, recently funded uh, us to develop some resources to help doctors and midwives and others to talk to people about alcohol in pregnancy. 
many of them feel that they that it will anger or frighten women. They don't want to talk about alcohol, and they believe that it might stigmatise uh, children and families if they make this diagnosis. Our data were also able to be included in a report that went to a House of Representatives uh, inquiry on fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, which was published in 2013, and they called it FASD, the hidden harm. And this comes back to what I alluded to earlier, that kids with FASD are scattered throughout our community and we don't see them in Sydney. I see them because I have a clinic, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders clinic. I'm doing one tomorrow and I have two children and they're both in foster care. And quite often we see kids who've been taken away from their mothers because they're alcohol dependent, put into foster care and unbeknown to the, the, the people who are caring for them, they then develop major, often be, uh, behavioural and developmental problems. And then only the link is made between alcohol and, uh, and their problems. Now, this is interesting, the previous federal government um, in response to that report announced $20 million uh, to go towards fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Uh, that's been downgraded by the last government to $9.3 million, but nevertheless, that's good. Um, and uh, we're hoping soon to be able to get underway with a national strategy to address FASD. Uh, and again, this is an international issue. So, so this is a group that I was involved with uh, in Canada, and um, we put together a charter on the prevention of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, which was published in Lancet Global this year. So these children are very precious and worth nurturing, and uh, they are everyone in the community's business, and we must try and prevent fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So just finally, I'm going to touch on the issue of asylum seekers. Um, some facts. We currently have over 700 children detained in mainland Australia in detention centres and 148 on Christmas Island, 179 in Nauru, and 153 of these are, are babies under the age of 12 months. There are also a number of unaccompanied minors, mainly boys, between the age of 14 and 17, often who's, who have witnessed their parents be shot or abducted, who've been put on boats and, and sent, or not on boats, they've been sent out of their country and they've ended up in Indonesia, which is what happens to many of these asylum seekers. They end up somewhere and then they take the opportunities that arise. Um, the length of time is increasing that these children have been kept in detention and now the average is well over a year. And because of our current policy, children in Christmas Island, which is where I visited, who arrived after July of 19 last year, uh, are not being processed. So not only have they been in detention for over a year, but their claims for asylum haven't been um, met. So everyone has the right to seek asylum and to enjoy, uh, in other countries, asylum from persecution. Clearly we have to assess people before we can determine whether they are genuine refugees or not. And this is a global problem, but on the scale of things, I think Australia takes less than 1% of of um, uh, asylum seekers. So I wrote an article recently which, um, Tracy, you, you uh, mentioned in your invitation, called um, Has Compassion, we've had, which had the byline, Has Compassion Gone miss Missing on Christmas Island. So Christmas Island is miles away. It's a four hour flight from Perth or Darwin. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's tropical, it's subject to monsoonal rains and very high temperatures. And it's a closed environment. It's, it's forced immigration detention. So we're one of the only, I think we're the only country in the world, in fact, that forcibly detains people under these sorts of conditions. Um, and it's not surprising me that the kids, uh, when they draw home, uh, draw it uh, as it were a jail. This is the accommodation. And we, um, unlike the doctors who work in these places, because we were with the Human Rights Commission, we had free access not only to interview all of these families and children, but to visit their accommodation. Um, and you can see these were three by three metal containers in 40 degree heat, no privacy, very unsociable because there's only a door leading onto that wooden corridor, cramped and overcrowded conditions are not surprisingly, Tom, lots of infections and once someone gets one, everyone gets one. Um, nowhere to put an infant down to learn to, to crawl, nowhere for children to play, many spit, children we on the walkway and there were little air conditioners but of course you then have to have the door closed for the air conditioner 
A lot of kids had asthma, presumably because they all had viral infections, and the air conditioning, of course, made their bronchial constriction and, and asthma worse. And we really went on this particular visit in July because there were 15 women with babies under the age of 12 months who tried to commit suicide in the previous two weeks. And when we got there, there were 10 of them on 24-hour surveillance by these burly male guards with those doors that you saw um, open so that they were in full view of everyone feeding and, and sleeping, etc. And the unaccompanied minors are also a particular group who um, have often fled war, persecution, seen family members killed, etc. And are really a, a very depressed, sad lot of boys, crying much of the time, anxious. And one of the um, things we have denied these children is education. So none of these children have been to school for more than a year. Um, so this is one of the boys' drawings in his country uh, where he'd seen um, his family members shot. And he said, now we are hopeless. I'm very sad because I'm in detention in Australia. The government says there have been 128 cases of self-harm in children under the age of 18 in about a 12-month period up to March 2014. And certainly the children we saw were uh, often crying, had developed nightmares, flashbacks, bedwetting, uh, social withdrawal. There was a few kids who were electively mute. Children who developed stutters had withdrawn and refused to eat. Children with developmental delay. And this one girl, um, the head of the Human Rights Commission and I went to visit. She was under a blanket in her room. She'd been there for three days, a 12-year-old, and she said, my life is really death. Uh, I want to die because in death I know I can't live here anymore. And I know if I go back, they will kill me. How can I get free? I think that if I stay in the room forever, uh, no eat, no drink, I will die. Better I kill myself. And interestingly, this was a family of a woman who'd fled domestic violence uh, in a society that didn't tolerate a, a woman divorcing and looking after her children. Uh, this child was depressed. The mother had self-harmed. The brother had withdrawn and was no longer speaking. And there was a young, younger child who was failing to thrive. So Scott Morrison is not entirely to blame. Um, the policy that we're uh, working at under the mo at the moment um, came into being under Kevin Rudd's government. Um, but the point really I want to make is that we've got these people here now and we've actually got to treat them humanely. And I think our role as clinicians is not to take sides on the policy or the government, although it's difficult not to, um, and um, to, to say that we've really got to advocate that these children need adequate health care, they need adequate education and the health care is very limited. And to get any specialised care, they need to be transferred to Australia. And there have been long, really unacceptable delays. So Scott Morrison, who's currently responsible for this, has got a moral burden. It's very heavy. It's a pain to drag around. And sometimes it almost sinks his boat. He wishes he could stash it away somewhere out of sight and out of mind. But there it is again. It's hard to ignore, but somehow he manages it. Um, and I think when you think about what has gone missing on Christmas Island, freedom, dignity, autonomy, education, recreation, optimal health care, sanitation, privacy, safety, and hope. So these children really are being denied many of the human rights which are, Australia has signed on to through the United Nations Convention for the Rights of the Child. So thank you for listening. And uh, I hope I've made you think about some of the issues in which you could get involved and, and act as advocates.